I'd like to introduce our next speakers, uh, a group of three speakers that are here today to talk about acute stroke care, advances in acute stroke care. Dr. Megan Donahue, who practices in Salt Lake and specializes in vascular, neuro uh, vascular neurology, neurology and psychiatry. Uh, Dr. Coleman Herod, who is a staff radiologist, uh, neuroimaging section chief at Summit Physician Specialist in Salt Lake City, and Dr. Maria Jefferson, who is a staff interventional radiologist, and uh, we see here at McCain. I know she works at some other places. Uh, help me welcome these speakers uh, speaking on acute stroke care. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Uh, we're going to tag team this, so I'll start and then we'll just divide the hour into three um, and hopefully have time for questions at the end. But I'm excited to be here today to talk to you about some advances, some especially recent advances in the past few years about stroke care. Um, as mentioned, I'm a neurohospitalist and the stroke director at Intermountain Medical Center, so I will focus on the neurology side, the neurohospitalist side, and then we've got the radiology, neuroradiology side, and then the neurointervention side. Let's see. So just to start off, um, for the first 15 or 20 minutes, I'll talk to you about some basic stroke statistics, um, and then I'll bring in a case um, that Maria and I shared last year, um, and then talk about some treatment updates and the overall recommendations for acute stroke therapy, and then a little bit about what a comprehensive stroke center is and summarize, and then we'll pass the, the baton on to Coleman. So stroke is the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. It's the number one cause of disability, as you can imagine. There's approximately 800,000 strokes each year, and every 40 seconds, someone has a stroke in the US. Every three minutes and 42 seconds, someone dies of a stroke, and stroke accounts for one in every 19 deaths in the US. So seven million Americans over 20 years old report having had a stroke. Um, from 1995 to 2011, stroke hospitalization rates doubled for young males, so 18 to 44-year-old males. Approximately 90% of stroke risk is attributable to modifiable risk factors, so high blood pressure, obesity, hyperlipidemia, hyperglycemia, renal dysfunction, and about three quarters is attributed to behavioral risk factors like smoking, sedentary lifestyle, and diet. Um, and then 29% is attributed to air pollution, which we just heard about. So just to briefly uh, remind you, there are three major different types of strokes. So there's ischemic stroke, which we will be talking about today, um, and that accounts for 87% of strokes. And then we have intracerebral hemorrhage in the middle one here. This is a normal head CT, an ischemic stroke about 24, 48 hours old, and then a, a, uh, intracerebral hemorrhage, and then a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So, 10% uh, of strokes are intracerebral hemorrhage and about 3% are subarachnoid hemorrhage. But we'll focus on ischemic strokes today. Let's move to a case real quick, um, just to get us all on the same page. This is um, from la about last May, I think. 47-year-old man stumbled out of his house at 6 a.m. His coworker was gonna pick him up and bring him to work. All he could say when he got in the car was, the words holy cow, and the friend or the coworker thought he was acting strange and he wasn't talking as much as usual, but he thought it was just because it was so early in the morning. When they arrived at work, the patient couldn't get out of the car, and it turns out later he had right-sided weakness, but the coworker was smart enough to bring him straight to the emergency room. So as you can imagine, the initial history was very challenging. We didn't really know what happened to this guy and when it started or any of that. So on his exam, well, what happened was he got to the hospital um, before the neurologist was available in the hospital to see him because this is early in the morning. But um, we have a telehealth system set up um, with McKady Hospital, so I was able to see him on camera from um, down in Murray. 
So I evaluated them on camera, and we do an NIH stroke scale to evaluate patients. So we have a sense of how severe their deficits are. We have a way to track it. And we have a common language when we talk about patients. So uh, it's a scale of 11 different um, pieces, and we go through them in a systematic way and kind of give the patient an overall number. So his overall number was 23, which is a relatively high stroke scale. But he got points for he was a little drowsy. He couldn't answer these questions at all. Actually, he couldn't speak at all. Um, he could only follow one command. Um, he had gaze deviation, and he had complete right side of weakness, couldn't move his right arm or leg at all, and he had a slight facial droop. And then he had um, some speech. He couldn't talk, and he gets points for dysarthria because you can't talk, um, and a little bit of neglect. So he had a pretty severe stroke going on. Um, the problem in his, this case was we didn't know his last known well. And we need to know his last known well to categorize him into what treatment category he's eligible for. So I saw him, and we started getting his work up. We got this exam, and we got some imaging. So what is he eligible for? We'll come back to him after we talk about the different eligibility categories and what we have from current data. So we have um, IV thrombolytics, TPA, or alteplase, and we have endovascular therapy, or thrombectomy. Thrombectomy has made huge strides in the past few years in terms of the data that supports it. Um, and we even have some advancement in, in the IV thrombolytics as well. So here's just a, a brief timeline to try to orient you. It's not to scale because I made it myself. Um, but the NINDS trial is the first trial in 1995 that um, helps, uh, showed us that TPA was beneficial for stroke patients. Um, I'll show you the data from this in a minute, but as we move on, in 2008, we have the next step up from three to four and a half hours. Now patients, some patients are eligible for TPA. And then in 2015, there were six separate randomized control trials that showed um, endovascular therapy or thrombectomy within the zero to six hour time window could benefit these pa acute stroke patients. Um, and then just last year, uh, 2000, late 2017 and early 2018, we had Dawn and Diffuse, which Diffuse 3, which were two, again, um, tr randomized controlled trials for extending the endovascular time window. So now instead of zero to six hours, in select patients, it's six to 18 or six to 24 hours. Um, and then just last week, there was another publication of a randomized controlled trial looking at from 4.5 to 9 hours for IV TPA in select patients. So let me take you through those real fast. I promise I'll try not to bore you, and then we'll move on to the imaging part of this. This is from the 1995 NINDS trial, and what it looked at was at three months what the disability of the patients was. So randomized patients to TPA or alteplase and to placebo, and I want to draw your attention to the modified Rankin scale is uh, the scale of disability that we use. It goes from zero, which is no disability at all after your stroke, to six or death. Um, and what this trial was able to show was at, at, three, at 90 days, um, the patients that got TPA had a much higher chance of um, having a good outcome, a relatively no disability at, at 90 days compared to the placebo patients. So 39% versus 26% which is statistically significant, and the number needed to treat would be seven. So pretty good medication in terms of um, uh, number needed to treat. The, everyone's most feared um, side effect of TPA is bleeding, and it did show that TPA patients had a slightly higher, or did have a higher risk of hemorrhage, in, intracranial hemorrhage, so 6.4% compared to the placebo rate of 0.6%. But as you can see, this didn't drastically affect the mortality or the survival um, rates. Now there were several initial TPA trials, and when all that data was pooled in this analysis in 2004, they noticed that possibly there was a, um, a benefit to TPA further out than just three hours. And so they looked at the adjusted odds ratio, and when you see that odds ratio cross one, you might think that there's no benefit anymore, and it crosses, um, or at least the confidence intervals cross much later than the three-hour time window. 
So um, this was the rationale behind the next trial um, that was published in 2008. Uh, this is the ECAS-3 trial. And it looked at TPA in the three to four and a half hour time window. The, this trial limited the patient population a little bit more, so it excluded people if they were over 80. It excluded you if you were on warfarin for any reason. Um, and it excluded you if you had had a prior stroke and you had diabetes. So they were trying to narrow the, um, they were trying to get better results and they were trying to narrow the patient population. But it limits us in recommending this for all patients in this window. But we do offer it to patients that meet those criteria. And now this is a similar depiction of the results. Again, we have um, placebo, a zero to one modified Rankin scale at 90 days. So we're looking at the same time frame. And we're comparing that to um, the TPA alteplase group. And we see a difference, which was significant. But the number needed to treat here is 14. So the sooner you give TPA, the better. Now, in 2015, well, I skipped 2013. There were a couple tri endovascular trials that came out that didn't show benefit. Um, and there was lots of feedback as to why they, how they were designed, and maybe that was the problem. But at the same time, advances in the acute stroke um, endovascular equipment also occurred during this time period. And Maria might be able to shed some light on the evolution of that later. Um, but in 2015, we had six randomized control trials that were published within a six-month period. And this is their pooled data. But what they, they also were able to show a very similar 90-day modified Rankin scale difference between the two groups. As you see, there's a theme here in stroke um, therapy. We, we look at 90-day outcomes. Um, but you can see that between the control and the intervention population, there's a significant difference. And then just recently, um, 2017 and 18, we had the Dawn, oops, sorry, the Dawn and the Diffuse 3 um, trials released slightly different time windows, but both extended beyond six hours, one to 18 and one to 24. And on the top, we have Diffuse 3, and the bottom, we have Dawn. And here they chose 0 to 3 to look at. But you can still, in this graf graphic, look at 0 to 1, 0 to 2. And you can see that in the endovascular therapy arms, in both groups, you see now um, a significant benefit um, when compared to just medical therapy alone. These patients were treated only if they had um, imaging that suggested there was still tissue to save. So, we have perfusion imaging, which is available now, that can tell you what part of the brain is actually the core and has already died or is unsalvageable, and then what part of the brain is still able to be salvaged if we can reperfuse. So it's fascinating that you can now select patients based on how big the core is and how big the perfusion, the penumbra is, and if you take patients with a big enough ratio, that enough tissue left to save, you can, we've shown that you can actually give them a better functional outcome and potentially save these people. I mean, if you look on the other end of the spectrum, we're looking at the four, the five or six, um, and you're seeing that these are patients that are dead or severely disabled, and there's a much smaller number in that category compared to placebo for medical therapy. And the number needed to treat in this time window with the right, correct patients is 2.8, so extremely low number needed to treat, which is amazing. And then just last week, May 9th, um, we had a publication that looked at um, using perfusion imaging to guide just TPA therapy, not just endovascular therapy. So looking from 4.5 to 9 hours um, after the last known well, um, and using that same perfusion technology to look at the mismatch of a core and the penumbra, and giving TPA if it looks like there's tissue to salvage. And this trial as well showed a significant difference, not quite as large as the others, but enough to think about. Actually, the first initial analysis wasn't significant, but if they adjusted for certain factors, it was. So this is not quite the game changer, but it's still interesting to think about extending the time window for thrombolytics and all the research that's going on in this field at the moment. So let's go back to our case. What's he eligible for? We actually don't know his last known well. We did find out from his coworker, who's the only person that we have contact with at this point, um, that he was 
fine last night at 8 p.m. So we are potentially within 12 hours at this point. And a couple years ago, there would be nothing that we could have done for this gentleman. Um, we would have just treated him medically for a stroke, and he probably would have been left with extreme aphasia and right-sided weakness for the rest of his life. But he now meets eligibility for other treatments. And um, he didn't meet for TPA. He wasn't within three or four and a half hours at the time that we knew. We'll find out later he was. But, um, and we certainly didn't know about this nine hour window then. But he did meet for this wake up stroke or this up to 24 hour, 18 hour time window. Um, and so we sent him to treatment and the rest will be the rest of the presentation. But um, you'll find out how he did later. But for now, just to explain stroke care around the state and around the country, we have different levels of stroke care. So we have primary stroke centers that offer um, excellence in TPA, and at times they can provide thrombectomy treatment or endovascular therapy. Comprehensive stroke centers are another step of excellence. They provide the latest treatments for acute stroke therapy, both for aneurysms, AVMs, and for thrombectomy, um, 24 hours um, a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, and then they also can help orchestrate complex systems of care to treat patients safely and quickly. So in this case, the comprehensive center at Murray, in Murray, at Indian Mountain, was able to radio in through telestroke technology, evaluate this patient, and get him tra treated almost as quickly as if there was a neurologist in the emergency department at that time. So just in a quick summary, life, a stroke is a, an emergency. Life-saving and disability-saving medication and therapy needs to be initiated within, and for this talk, I had to change it to 24 hours. So previously it had been six, but now it's 24. Um, and then the sooner we re restore the blood flow, the better chance of recovery. So just because we have this amount of time doesn't mean we should wait. We still need to triage these patients very quickly. Um, treatment windows and options for therapy continue to expand, um, and I think it's an exciting time for stroke therapy. So I'm going to pass you off to Dr. Herod, who's going to speak about imaging and how much that's changed in acute stroke therapy as well. And then we'll take questions at the end. Thank you, Megan. My name is Coleman Herod. I'm a diagnostic neuroradiologist um, most of the time, and I spend much of my time um, at Intermountain Medical Center in Murray and work a lot with Megan um, in the acute stroke uh, pathway. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about diagnostic imaging in the setting of acute stroke um, and use the same patient that Megan brought up um, as a case example. I'm going to review that patient's imaging. Um, so from the diagnostic imager standpoint um, and in conjunction with the diagnostic neurology workup and decisions about what to do with therapy, um, we have these different areas that become potential discrepancies um, in terms of how much we trust, what we know, um, and what we're going to do about it. And with diagnostic imaging, um, we can, with CT or MR imaging, help time and date or confirm um, time of onset, more or less, um, in sort of several hour increments. We can evaluate for other diagnoses in the brain in the CNS that might be um, confusing um, or lead us to believe that someone may be having a stroke when something else entirely different is going on. Um, and we can also now have a pretty good estimate for degree of infarction at time of the patient's presentation and in conjunction with that, have an idea of what the um, volume of threatened and potentially salvageable tissue is. That's what um, really the, the core of acute stroke imaging is. It's um, excluding other things, dating um, the symptoms, and trying to decide if there's enough threatened tissue that it's worth trying to save in heroic ways relative to the amount of tissue that's already too far gone. Um, so we do see uh, improved outcomes um, year after year at Intermountain, and uh, Megan just walked you through all those several studies which have contributed to this, 
Um, and essentially, we've seen validation of the, med validation of the medical therapy um, and, and intervention. And from the diagnostic standpoint and imaging, um, we've seen um, more widespread distribution of advanced imaging technology. It's a CT scanner is available you know, in almost any hospital, probably any hospital in the United States these days. Um, it impre improved speed with diagnosis and communication with um, implementation of the digital imaging. So we talked about the modified Rankin scale um, as, or Megan did, as our um, way of ranking outcome. And I left this slide in only because I made it the other day and reviewed it um, a couple nights ago with my 10-year-old son. And he asked me about this and we talked about it. And he had the audacity to say, to ask me where I ranked on the modified Rankin scale. <laughs> and then he said, you're definitely not normal. And then he ran out of the room. So um, we have, um, at our Intermountain Comprehensive Stroke Center, uh, we really struggle and work well with interdisciplinary cooperation. Uh, time is brain, and so every minute and minutes that pass, we're losing uh, neurons in the setting of acute stroke. And these are the various departments and sections with whom we work. So we have a diagnostic imaging algorithm in terms of what we're going to do from an imaging standpoint um, to try to work a patient up. And it's really based on the time of onset of symptoms the availability of technology in a certain center, and a correlation between what imaging is going to do for us and making a decision about what it's going to do for therapy. So from a neuroimaging standpoint, it comes down really to, are we going to scan this person with a CT scanner or an MR scanner, and why are we going to make those decisions um, based, on, based on what are we going to make those decisions? In the setting of acute stroke these days in the United States, the CT scanner is our workhorse. Um, because of its availability, its speed, its relative safety. Um, we can scan someone with a CT scanner without having to interview them about foreign bodies, metal that might be in their body. And with a CT scanner, we can take a look at the brain, we can take a look at the vessels in the uh, head and the neck, and we can um, take a look at the brain's perfusion. So these are the three studies we can do within several minutes. And the setting of um, acute stroke workup, we can have this imaging done and interpreted and report out uh, typically within about 30 to 40 minutes. We can get our images performed really quickly, we can um, diagnose or we can interpret them quickly and then communicating them typically we try to have happen I think within a 45 minute window. The CT brain without contrast, the CT angiogram and the CT brain perfusion exams um, allow us to evaluate what we call the four P's, the cerebral parenchyma the pipes or the vascularity and the perfusion of the brain and then to look for this penumbra or this shadow of threatened potentially salvageable tissue relative to a core infarct. So back to our um, case example, we have this 47-year-old man, had pretty strange symptoms, kept saying, holy cow. He showed up um, and got funneled into the acu acute stroke pathway um, is identified as what we call a code stroke patient. Um, was evaluated by teleneurology and started off having a CT contrast that we were able to perform and interpret. So this is one axial slice from this gentleman's brain. It's normal, normal looking, as it should be in the setting of an acute stroke that hasn't progressed to complete infarction. So in a CT, non-contrast CT brain report in the setting of acute stroke, if it's read as normal, it doesn't mean the person is not encountering um, acute ischemia. It means we don't see the evidence of it yet. Not seeing the evidence of it yet typically implies that that individual is still a candidate for TPA. We begin to see abnormalities sometimes as soon as 12 hours, uh, sometimes as late as 24 hours on a non-contrast brain CT. The non-contrast brain CT also allows us to exclude other diagnoses. This is a different patient who might have presented in the same way who's got acute intracranial hemorrhage we see here as hyperdensity and adjacent edema within the left hemisphere. Uh, this is a pretty nasty looking non-contrast CT of the brain of a patient with neurocystisarcosis. Um, this would be an infectious process that might present as an acute stroke. This person's probably had this infection for years. Um, they often present with seizure, but at times we see folks that have lots of chronic bad processes in their brain show up with acute stroke-like symptoms. 
And this is an example of a tumor that showed up in the ER on a non-contrast brain CT in a patient that had acute stroke-like symptoms. So this is an example of um, an infarcted brain more than 24 hours after onset. If we see something like this, we know that the patient um, is beyond the acute treatment therapy pathway. And we, in this set kind of setting, give someone an ASPECTS score. The ASPECTS score is the Alberta Stroke Program Early CT Brain Scoring. And essentially, um, we give them a score based on how much volume we think of brain is gone. And it gives us a prediction as to what outcome is going to be. So this guy scored pretty, pretty low. So beyond parenchyma, the second P is pipes in the, in the uh, setting of acute um, stroke workup and CT imaging. So we're looking for abnormalities in the intracranial, arterial, or venous vasculature. Um, and in this setting, we see a CT angiogram right here in our 47-year-old gentleman who keeps saying, holy cow. Um, in looking at his non-contrast CT at a different slice level, um, on the axial plane, we see what we call the hyperdense MCA sign. So there's thrombus in this um, M1 segment of the left MCA that presents here in this post-contrast angiogram as a filling defect. So the CT angiogram is performed when we inject iodinated contrast um, into a vein. We time things uh, with our scanner based on a pacification of the aorta and then try to scan a patient's head and neck from the aortic arch up to the vertex um, during the arterial phase, and typically we're pretty good at getting an arterial and venous phase. We can evaluate for um, aneurysm, we can evaluate for dissection, we look for occlusions, and we can evaluate the veins for venous thromboses. In this setting, we call this a large vessel occlusion, which is sort of like a, a, a bell ringer for we may be able to progress towards um, endovascular therapy. This is uh, just a coronal view of the same right here with this cutoff abrupt of his left MCA. Um, so the last two Ps are the perfusion and penumbra. So when we perform perfusion imaging, um, we scan through the brain repeatedly while we're injecting contrast again. And we watch the contrast come in through the large vessels, diffuse through smaller capillaries, then pass into the deep cortical veins and out of the dural venous sinuses. And in doing so, we can look for areas of decreased perfusion and um, make decisions as to what aspect of the brain has so severely decreased perfusion that we think it is dead brain or the core of an infarct, and what surrounding that area might be a penumbra of threatened tissue that is going to progress to infarct if we don't intervene. So this is an example um, of some color maps from a CT brain perfusion scan same one, this is the scan from that gentleman. Um, and this, said, this shows us essentially our non-contrast CT anatomic correlate. And each one of these maps is post-processed to allow us to evaluate for mean transit time of blood into the brain, uh, time to max or time to peak enhancement. This is a relative cerebral blood volume map, and this is a relative cerebral blood flow map. So as we'll see in a second, we have hard values that we believe in, in terms of cerebral perfusion. But when we're making decisions um, on the, in the diagnostic pathway in imaging in America these days, we typically use relative values. So we're really looking at one side of the brain versus the other. And here we can see that the left side of this gentleman's brain has decreased perfusion. So we're seeing a prolonged time to peak. It's taking longer for blood to get to this part of the brain. And it's a little more subtle here, but the, the blue here shows us there is decreased blood volume in the distribution of the left MCA relative to the contralateral hemisphere. So this is a map that shows us volume specific. And here, again, it's a, it's a relative to the contralateral side of the brain. Um, and these areas that show color show areas of decreased blood volume. So we're worried really about irreversibly injured tissue having a relative decreased blood volume of about 30% compared to a contralateral presumed normal brain. And in patients that have had previous strokes um, or have some other pathology going on, um, we can't trust this information typically. This is a relative cerebral blood flow map. We use a similar about 30% 
um, comparison to the contralateral brain or relative flow and looking for significant decreases. These over here, as I think we had them on our previous slide as well, are the, um, the hard values of what we think is normal perfusion, so normal blood volume per 100 grams of cerebral tissue is about 5 ml. Um, when I started doing this about 15 years ago, we tried to calculate these and present them in a report, and it turns out um, that the software that uses this relative um, perfusion information has been validated in many of the studies that Megan described. So now this is sort of the standard of care in America. Um, so finally, this is our time to maximum perfusion. And this gives us a pretty good idea of what is really profoundly impacted brain is going to die, um, what is normal or close to normal, and then some kind of in-between brain that's, that doesn't have normal perfusion um, but it's not definitely going to pass or with strong comments it's going to pass into dead tissue. And essentially we take all that information and we have sort of a summary map that we make and take a look at. And here we're looking for, on this side of the page, we're looking at what we think are areas of complete infarction, a core infarct that is not salvageable. So um, you could take this box more or less and cut it in half and these images here parallel these images here. So what we're looking for in a case like this are areas that they show up as pink, actually, um, on the rapid ischemia view software package we have. And pink voxels here would, just, would denote definitively infarcted tissue. On the left, we have what we think is the threatened tissue that's potentially salvageable. And down here, we have um, a couple values. We say that the Tmax is, that's greater than six seconds is 237 mLs in volume. So that's a lot of brain um, that has compromised blood flow. It's taking longer for blood to get there. It's potentially salvageable. We'll look for the, what we call a mismatch volume down here. And in the Diffuse 3 trial, I think the mismatch volume um, had to be greater than 70 mL. So this guy would qualify for us to do something about it from an endovascular standpoint based on what we see so far. And then the mismatch ratio we say is infinite. There's an infinite ratio between what we, see, what we see here and nothing. And in the Diffuse 3 trial, the mismatch ratio had needed to be greater than 1.8. So we can say here that there is a lot of brain that's threatened, a lot of brain that will or probably will go on to become infarcted. And from what we can see right now, we don't see anything in his brain at that standpoint that is definitively infarcted. So with CT brain perfusion, CTA, non-contrast CT in the acute stroke pathway, we can correlate what we see on imaging to confirm that the brain um, is not any worse off than we think it is from an acute, acute stroke standpoint. The person doesn't have another diagnosis. We can confirm that there is a small or non-existent core of irreversible injury here um, and that there is significant salvageable tissue. So we can see all this information quickly. I'm usually on the phone with someone while the patient is still in the scanner as the first images are coming over. We have another conversation, usually several minutes later when we have all this post-processed data to discuss. Um, and then the call is made to Dr. Maria Jefferson, who is our interventional radiologist, who comes to do the hard work. Okay, so as they already explained to you all, um, the things that we want to see when somebody's calling us, so about 10% of stroke patients really actually ever make it to, to IR. If they have a small occlusion or they're having other issues, they're not coming to see us. So about 10% of them will actually make it to us. What we're looking for is a large vessel occlusion, usually in the anterior circulation. Um, it can be the internal carotid artery or the proximal middle cerebral artery. Um, now with these new trials that have come out, like they've uh, already reviewed with you, we can take patients up to 24 hours and select patients. Um, what we really want to see is salvageable tissue. So we want to see a mismatch between the clinical defect and the infarct volume, or a mismatch between the ischemic volume and the infarct volume. And we want it to be, at least from the trials, greater than 1.8%, or 
um, good functional status beforehand and no intracranial hemorrhage on that original um, CT. So I want to see the CTA and the perfusion um, data. That's usually when they're giving us a call. So they have a patient, they have a high clinical suspicion, it's going to be a large vessel infarct. Um, while the patient's in the scanner um, and the images are coming across is oftentimes when we're getting called, or at least the CTA images have been done. Um, the way the procedure itself works is they're going to come uh, up to our interventional suite. We get access into the common femoral artery. We actually, the devices in order to take these clots out are, um, require us to put in a large hole. Eight French hole is about as large as we can do to put in a closure device, otherwise we have to use special closure techniques, so this is a pretty big hole we put in their leg. Um, we shoot a cerebral angiogram to confirm the findings that we saw on the CT, and then we do the thrombectomy. Um, these days, the, the two main ways that we uh, try to take the clot out is either with suction which, or aspiration, and the main device that we typically use is something called a penumbra device. Um, or a stent retriever, and we put the stent across it. There's a major push that we do aspiration first. It's the fastest thing for us to get up there, and it's the first thing they want us to do. So we go up, we try to aspirate the clot first. Um, if we're successful, great. If not, then we have a choice of either continuing to just do aspiration again, or to go ahead and put in a stent retriever, or we can actually do a combination of the two. So we can put in the stent retriever and leave our suction device at the end of it and kind of take both of them out at the same time. Um, after the procedure, um, the major thing that they need is just groin precautions. So all they have is just a Band-Aid on their groin, otherwise they wouldn't know that we were there. Um, and the potential risks of the procedure is we can shower emboli from us going up there. We can convert to a hemorrhagic um, infarction from us kind of reperfusion injury. Um, we can cause injury to the vessels that we're in or cause a dissection from our uh, catheters. And they can get access hematomas and complications in their groins. Um, so this is the patient um, that they've already reviewed with you. Um, he had come into the ER on a very, very, very good day for him. So um, we had actually already planned that day to have an early start time. Um, we had a general anesthesia case that was supposed to start at 7.30. They happened to call me right at 7.30 before we'd wheeled the patient into the room. So our room was already prepped and ready. Our techs were there. And actually, myself and Dr. Webb were there that day in order to do the complex case. So we had a second set of hands as well. Um, he had his perfusion imaging done. This is about the holy grail of um, perfusion imaging because it's all salvageable and there's no infarct yet. So he has nothing but um, brain that we can restore. So that's exactly what we want to see. This rapid software is what was used in the Diffuse 3 trials. Um, and we're very lucky to have it here. Um, we have it both at McKay D Hospital and down at IMC. Um, it, so it makes it very fast and easy. This is his initial cerebral angiogram. Um, so this is that vessel cutoff um, in his left M1 circulation. So uh, internal carotid artery comes up and then it, everything abruptly stops and you see that there's no perfusion over here on the side of the brain. We went up and did one pass with an aspiration device. This is about as good as it gets. Um, and our second shot shows that that is fully reperfused um, and we, we're done. We don't, we pull everything out. Um, as quickly as we can. And this was his follow-up MRI post 24 hours. So he did have a little bit of, of residual infarct. However, the patient himself didn't have any residual deficits. And I think he either left the hospital the next day or the day after. Um, these are some companion cases, just to give you guys, I didn't have all the pictures from that one, so just to give you guys some others. Very similar, um, onset of aphasia and right side weakness, um, high stroke scale, um, patient comes in, he gets his non-contrast CT, we see the hyperdense vessel sign, we see an abrupt cutoff on his CTA. Here's a better idea of what the perfusion software looks like when there is infarct. So here's the infarct on the right-hand side and the, um, and the salvageable brain. The mismatch ratio is much higher than the, uh, than the 1.8 that we want to see. There's lots of, lots of volume for us to preserve, so we would want to take this patient. Again, his initial images, so an abrupt cutoff. Um, this was one pass with an aspiration device, and again, you see there's reperfusion to the brain. Um, this is actually a picture of that clot that came out. And this, so we're timed um, from the moment that that patient hits the hospital until um, they get into our room and whether or not we're able to retrieve the clot. So these are our goals. Um, once they come in, they call a stroke alert. They, if they need to get telestroke on the phone, um, they do the non-con head CT. If they're going to get TPA, then they 
um, initiate that as quickly as possible. We do not stop what we are doing if they got TPA. We, don't, we want them to be on those blood thinners. That doesn't prevent us from being able to do our punctures. Um, and we track our puncture time and how many passes we do and what our retrieval time is. Um, this is that patient, so lots of salvageable brain. Here was the area that was infarcted, and here's his follow-up MRI. So again, this gives you an idea of that area was what we would expect to see infarcted, but the rest of it was salvaged. Um, and he did very, very well for his recovery. Um, similar patient, this patient was up in the cath lab getting a left atrial ablation, um, had acute onset right hemiplegia and aphasia, transferred to the emergency room. He was not a candidate for TPA therapy um, because he was on the anticoagulation for the, uh, for the atrial ablation. Um, so he was transferred to the in, uh, interventional suite. This is non-con head. Again, you see the hyperdense vessel sign. Again, here's the CTA and you see the cutoff of the vessel. Um, for him, we actually shot our initial angiogram and you can see there's a little bit of discoloring in the internal carotid artery here, and we actually, um, here's the cutoff going into the MCA. And for him, you don't see his anterior circulation either. This is what the aspiration device looks like when we put it up there. Um, and then this is after one pass with the aspiration device. Now you can see his anterior cerebral artery and his middle cerebral artery. Um, and this is the clot that we took out of there, so it was extending all the way down. Um, here was his follow-up MRI post 24 hours. He also recovered without noticeable deficits. So from our standpoint, um, time is brain, uh, fast identification of symptoms, imaging, TPA if eligible, and the notification of the angio team as soon as possible. For us here at McKay, we have the option of using our typical room or um, the cath labs. We will pull a patient off the table if we need to. You won't see us, this is the thing you will see us move absolutely the fastest for, both because we're being tracked for our procedure times as well as um, because time is brain and the longer it takes, the less likely to have a positive outcome. Um, because of these new trials that came out last year, um, we now can take patients out to 24 hours with, when the patient has salvageable tissue and high baseline function. Um, so there is, uh, a little bit of a debate on who should be doing stroke interventions. Um, there's some push um, in the country kind of as a whole of whether or not they should only be neuro, um, neurointerventional and neurosurgeon fellowship trained people or whether or not these should be body people like myself and Dr. Webb. Um, the, the debate comes from the fact that there are just plainly not enough neurointerventionalists and neurosurgeons that do these procedures in order to service all of the stroke patients that are out there. Um, so the way that it is here is we are all actually, there are neurointerventionalists, there are body interventionalists, we are all part of the same call pool and we do the interventions both here and at Intermountain Medical Center. So it wouldn't matter which hospital you were at, you were going to get access to, to one of us um, at, at any of these. Um, McKD is a, what they call a primary stroke center, Intermountain Medical Center is what they call a comprehensive stroke center. The, from our standpoint, from the interventional standpoint, again, these are the same thing. There's no difference in the requirements between the two. Um, the major difference is that, that they do, they coil, our neurointerventionalists are down there um, and coil aneurysms and uh, kind of do more advanced neuro work beyond stroke. But at least from the, from the interventional standpoint, it's the same people either place, and we believe that that's better because we're providing more access, because even a half an hour delay in treatment is going to affect their ability to recover. Um, there is a newer designation that they've kind of come out with more recently called a thrombectomy capable stroke center, which I don't think we've, we have one in the region. Um, these are just the, the differences between the two. Do you guys want to come up here for questions or no? So question, um, once a patient is diagnosed with stroke and they've had their TPA, the decision from there as to whether they get um, an endovascular thrombectomy, is that based on whether they continue to have symptoms or not or are they automatically thrown into that tract? Good question. So most of the endovascular trials looked at a cutoff of an NIH stroke scale, um, anywhere from 5, 6, 
10 in the later trials. So um, typically, if they still have a severe deficit, then we will send them. Um, it takes a little while to activate the team, so we'll call. And if the patient has resolved completely by the time the team gets there, often we won't go. Or if they've got a stroke scale of one or two and it's not a severe deficit. You could have a two that's a severe aphasia and no one would, or people might choose to still take on that risk with that low stroke scale. Um, so it depends on the patient, but oftentimes we'll activate as, we'll do multi, kind of it all happens at once. So as we're mixing the TPA, we're getting that CT angiogram, giving the bolus probably right when the CTA is starting or finishing, and then um, as soon as we see that large vessel, we call intervention. By then the imaging is finished, the perfusion scan's finished. So it's kind of a toggle of multiple things. But yes, if they completely resolve with TPA, we would most likely hold off. The vessels you showed look so very pristine and lovely. What would you do about significant internal carotid artery stenosis? It's tough. I'll let you answer. Um, it somewhat depends. Sometimes um, it depends on what the patient's symptoms are, what their perfusion look like as to whether or not we would continue on to do something. Usually if we have tandem lesions like that, we actually call our neurointerventionalist to come and do stenting or do something else in order to get to that lesion. Um, but sometimes we will stent the carotid artery at the same time that we're doing the, the retrieval. And, some, and sometimes access is an issue, getting to the lesion. So having to, I think we've done a carotid puncture a couple of times down at IMED to get around an aortic stenosis, yeah. So, so um, those are very pretty vessels. Sometimes um, it can take us half an hour just to get up to the brain because we've got to form special catheters and put in different types of sheaths and kind of we're working from a very long distance away and so you're trying to translate that force to, through a torturous vasculature to get up to where you need to be. Um, so. Um, yeah, some, I, not too long ago, they did do a, a direct carotid puncture trying to overcome some of that. Or if the patient's just really tall or has a really long torso, those can also be challenges. Can you, does the extra scanning to check perfusion after you do your uh, angiogram, how much extra time does that add to the procedure? So it's, it's minimal. We can do those three scans in, I don't know, minutes. You're often in, Megan Dawson is in the room, 10 minutes maybe. And uh, in theory, the imaging should immediately be available for me to see in the next room over on a screen. And we run into issues with that sometimes. Um, but typically, I'm on the phone with someone like Megan as soon as the non contrast brain has performed, or while it's being performed, and I'm seeing the images come up. And if we can say, uh, we don't see anything acute. Um, then that can give that um, neurologist uh, the green light to sort of keep pushing ahead. I have, a, I have a patient who has had four to six episodes that look just like stroke, but then he clears in a little while. Each episode is longer and deeper. He's higher on the, on the stroke scale. His wife is saying, so when do I bring him in? He's been in once with very normal scans. Would you answer that for me? It depends. <laughs> um, has, he's only had one normal MRI, correct? It's, that's a tough call. I mean, there are other mimics of stroke like this. So it could be seizure. Um, it could be a hemiplegic migraine. It could be a complex migraine without an actual headache that's hemiplegic. So there's once you, until you, I guess I would initiate a workup to try to figure out what it is actually that's causing that. Um, and then if you're convinced it's not vascular, then you can reassure the, the family. If you, does, did the patient have vascular imaging with that normal MRI brain? Yes, MRI, perfusion, consult. In fact, they had the TPA drawn up. Yeah. in the ER before they got negative studies, and then he cleared. But yeah, the yeah. last one was just last week, and he was four and a half hours with uh, not very much uh, right-sided, but a lot of expressive aphasia and a little bit of facial droop. That's a tough call. I mean, until I have an actual reason for it to happen, or unless I'm yeah. absolutely convinced that it's 
not stroke, then I would say keep coming to the emergency room because you don't know when he's actually going to stroke out. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. I'm an old angioplasterer. I want to compliment your team and what neurologists are now doing. This is a gorgeous case. I did my first acute STEMI angioplasty on a patient in 1981. I saw him 20 years later. He had a completely normal heart with normal scan. When you follow up, what are you looking for? Do you do a follow-up imaging? So most of the time, people don't need follow-up imaging. Um, we need to figure out why he had that clot happen in the first place. And this guy ended up having a prior PE, so now he's had two major thrombotic embolic events and is on anticoagulation, but we don't know exactly why he had it happen. But we try to prevent the next one. Um, if you get a vessel where you have to stent it, a carotid stent or um, you don't get complete uh, reperfusion, then there might in the future be follow-up imaging if you're worried that there's a territory at risk and there's further therapy that needs to be done. You're walking, talking, you're okay. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. 